All right, so good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending tonight's Tough Topics discussion. The Tough Topics series was created to provide a safe space uh, to discuss subjects that people may be afraid to ask questions about. This year, Shreve Memorial Library has partnered with the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Public Health Region 7 to bring you a series of discussions centered around opioid addiction and substance abuse. Tonight, we have Hershey Krippendorf, the Director of Development for the Philadelphia Center with us tonight to present Syringe Services Program, Reducing Harm and Saving Lives. So as we begin, I want to remind everyone to please keep your screens on mute and submit any questions that you may have through the chat box feature. And now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Hershey. Thank you, Samantha. You're welcome. So let me get this up. So, so today I'm going to be talking about syringe service programs um, and it's about reducing harm and saving lives. And like Samantha said, um, I'm Hershey Krippendorf and I'm the Director of Development at the Philadelphia Center, which is Region 7's um, Northwest Louisiana's HIV Resource Center. So we provide a plethora of um, services to um, from case management and permanent supportive housing for people that are living with HIV. Um, we also have a prep clinic um, that provides prescriptions for folks that are interested in taking the preventive medication for HIV, which has an effective um, rate of 99.9% .9 if taken um, daily. Um, let's see, we also have a GBT health center that is geared towards the gay, bisexual, and transgender community. And we do the whole panel of STD testing um, from HIV, hepatitis C, syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. And something very exceptional about this health clinic is that um, we also you, you can you can get STDs in multiple sites. So we do a um, we do swabs for your throat and then anal swabs for the STDs also. <laughs> and I can see my child's face like just, I'm sorry. And then also we um, we also do the urine test too. So you know STDs is not it, you can get it in multiple spots, but I digress as far as that goes. So. Um, we also have a prevention department that supplies um, 91 um, sites with free condoms that ranges from um, liquor stores to bars to barbershops, um, community health centers, Northwestern State University, a lot of the different colleges, um, you know, that are here in Region 7. So, and then we also do um, counseling and testing um, for anyone in our community and they can come in and get free HIV, hepatitis C and syphilis testing. Um, we also have Mercy Center, um, which is our per permanent supportive housing component that um, houses up to eight to 10 people that are living with HIV that needs a lot more support um, as far as a living environment goes. Um, and then we also have our syringe service program, which I will be talking about today. So, um, so we cannot talk about syringe service programs without discussing harm reduction. So the Harm Reduction Coalition defines harm reduction as a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. This harm reduction is also a movement for social justice built on and belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. So um, and this includes safe reuse, managed use. You know, the idea is to meet people that are using drugs or injecting drugs um, where they're at, regardless if they are actively using, you know, we want to provide supportive services wherever they're at. So um, harm reduction is a, it's, it's a, it's huge for people to understand that this is where syringe service programs comes into play. 
So the goals of um, harm reduction is to improve the health and well-being of individuals, their partners, families, and, com and communities. So the goals are to reduce mortality rates, empower and reduce stigma, eliminate transmission of diseases, and we also, harm reduction provides and bridges to health services, which includes, you know, access to treatment and to medical care, whether that be mental health or, you know, access and primary care. Um, and those are, the, those are the goals of harm reduction. So examples of harm reduction that we have here that people don't realize is that you get into a vehicle and you put your seatbelt on and that prevents you from, you know, from any harm happen happening to you if you get into an accident. The same thing goes with, you know, a parachute or sunscreen or, you know, having condoms, you know, readily available. And then that, you know, syringes, harm reduction is just not about providing sterile syringes. It's also about providing, doing the less, the least amount of harm um, of where a person is at in their life. So why do we do harm reduction? Um, harm reduction, so why we do harm reduction is that we want to rehumanize people that, who are using drugs. We want to provide a place for hope and healing you know, a safe place where there's no judgment, regardless of where they're at in their lives. Um, acceptance, um, we don't want to leave anybody behind. And that's why harm reduction is so important, is that people who use drugs or inject drugs, they're part of our community also. So we cannot leave them behind. So it's important to, to provide them with supportive services. So another reason why that um, harm reduction is important is that, as you can see on my slide, there is, here are all the deaths that occurred in Louisiana due to drugs, whether it be the opioids you'll see is in the teal. So last year, so 2019, we had 580. 88 opioid related deaths. And that was an increase of 25% from the prior year, which was 2018. So, you know, in 2019, drug involved deaths was 1,486. So, and that's too many. So, as far as if we can do something about it. So, um, I also wanted to share with you guys about the competitive comparison of drug deaths between last year and then this year and how COVID-19 has really affected us. Um, you know, a lot of our participants, it's this time is extremely stressful. A lot of our participants have lost their jobs. Um, now they're housing. So um, Louisiana, along with the entire nation, is witnessing a rise in fatal and non-fatal overdoses, you know, during this during COVID-19. And you can get all this information off of um, the Louisiana Department of Health has really done a really great job of um, gathering all the data and statistics for opioid deaths. So you can always go to the Louisiana Opioid um, Surveillance, Surveillance Program um, database, and you can just Google it, and that'll give you the most recent information if you really want to dive into the data. So let's talk about syringe service programs now. So North American Syringe Exchange Network has 450 syringe service programs that are operating nationwide. That probably include that probably does not include a lot of underground syringe service programs that um, it is not legal within their state. So here in the state of Louisiana, we have seven. 
So um, Alexandria, which our sister community-based organization class just approved, got their ordinance approved. And um, New Orleans and Baton Rouge has had theirs approved since 2017. So because they've been doing underground syringe service programs for years. So what is a, um, an SSP? So it's a community-based program that ideally provides comprehen comprehensive services from free sterile syringes and needles, safe disposal of syringes and needles, referrals for mental health, substance abuse treatment, um, medication assistance treatment, HIV and hepatitis C testing, and then also linkage to care. Um, into treatment or into case management. Um, we also provide overdose um, education like naloxone and then safer sex tools such as um, condoms and lubrication and then also access to PrEP if you know a participant is interested in PrEP. So why do we have syringe service programs? And I just wanna say of the 2,085 people that are living um, with HIV and AIDS in region seven, um, 139 of those people reported exposure, exposure was from injection drug use. So there's four different reasons why we do it. It's public safety, money, overdose deaths and access to treatment. I didn't have a picture of our little puppy dog, Abby. So I had to do with, with, this, little <laughs> with this little dog right here. So, um, so one in three officers may be stuck with a syringe during their career. Providing safe syringe disposal reduces needle stick injuries to not only first responders, but also sanitation workers. Because we heard throughout getting this ordinance passed, we heard so many times that, you know, somebody had seen a, syri a used syringe in the park or in the trash can or in just, you know, in public places that it doesn't need to be at. So it's super important that we provide a place that people can come and dispose of syringes properly. So. And then um, overdose deaths. So we provide naloxone to anybody that needs it. And so this reduces deaths by educating and distributing naloxone and medication to reverse overdoses. I must say that naloxone is only, um, it, is, it will only reverse an overdose for either heroin or, an op or opioids. So, and then I'll get to, you know, what our dynamic looks like of the people who inject drugs, you know, in the city of Shreveport. So it's extremely cost effective. So if somebody is injecting drugs and, um, you know, they test positive for HIV, it, there's a, it, it costs dollars treat somebody living with HIV during their lifetime. So, and the cost of hepatitis C is, um, it can range between 20 to 40,000, depending on their, what stage of, of, of liver failure they're in. And for us to provide a syringe service program, it costs 10 cents a piece for each sterile syringe. And we've calculated it to be, to, to cost about $750 to $1,500 per year, you know, for, for somebody that utilizes a syringe service program. And that's only here in Shreveport. So um, it's going to be a little bit different in New Orleans and Baton Rouge because they do have to pay for naloxone. So, and we've got a, um, we have a great collaborative agreement with CADA to provide us with naloxone. So, and then also syringe service programs, you know, provides access to treatment. Um, and we don't push 
any of our participants that come in, we don't push them to take anything. It's really on a needs basis. If they say that, hey, I'm ready to go to treatment, you know, we can help facilitate facilitate that for them. And that's just by picking up the phone and calling, you know, a peer, um, a peer person at CADA, and then they will take over that. So, you know, it's building the trust of this community um, is, is really important because they can, they feel comfortable coming to you if they're ready for help. So. Okay. So we're going to talk about how we came about of having a um, spring service program in the city of Shreveport. So in 2017, um, Governor John Bill Edwards signed into law that each town, city, municipality, you know, can make the decision to, um, to, to have a syringe service program or a needle exchange program in their in their community. So um, once we did that, we started talking to, to, to folks about getting a syringe service program in our community here. So, and um, we had the full backing of our board to move forward with getting a syringe service program. Our advocacy coordinator at that time, who is Chip Eaton, um, he initiated a conversation with city councilman Jeff Epperson, who has always been a champion of the work that we do at the Philadelphia Center. And he represented the district that the Philadelphia Center was in. So he took he took a couple of months there to, you know, kind of mull it over and do his research and then come up with and devise a plan to present to the city council. So and this is where our this is where community education comes into play here. So we wanted to make sure that we had the right people at the table. So when we began seeking out this ordinance. So we had, you know, of course, you know, our city councilman Jeff Efferson, the city attorney um, who wrote this specific ordinance. Um, the assistant district attorney, we, we wanted to make sure that we had the DA there because they are the ones that prosecuted all drug charges. Um, Center of Behavioral Health, um, Kata was there. Also interim Shreveport Police Chief Ben Raymond was there because we wanted to make sure that we had protections in place for our, um, our participants. So next comes the, I'm not going to read all this. This is just an excerpt from the ordinance and everything. So and um, the assistant city attorney, Danielle Farr, she was the one that wrote this ordinance. And everything that we did was we did not reinvent the wheel. We based everything that we did from New Orleans. Um, we have a great working relationship with NOSAP, which is the syringe service program through Crescent Cares, and then also a great relationship with the with the um, ladies at Tristereo. So um, everything that we got has pretty much it, it come from them. So we appreciate everything. They laid all the groundwork for us, which made it easier. So um, New Orleans was first, Baton Rouge was second. We're the third city that has, you know, that has a syringe service program here. So um, what we have in front of us right now on the PowerPoint, and it, it talks about, you know, the identification card. So when a participant comes into our, into our program, we do a very short intake. We don't take they don't even have to tell us what their name is. We don't need an identification card. We don't need any of that. So we just need the first two letters of your first name, the first two letters of your last name, and then your birth date, and that's it. Just in case, the reason why we have a unique identifier, you know, ID for them, is just in case the police calls us 
and said, hey, we have this participant, you know, in front of us and they're saying that we're, you're, they're a part of your program. That way we'll be able to identify them without any further information. So, um, but I do want to point out that, um, you know, on this, on this ordinance, we wanted to make sure that we protected, you know, the folks that are coming to our program. So this identification card provides them, they cannot be charged with a paraphernalia charge whatsoever. So, which is huge because that's a lot, that's a huge fear from our participants is that, you know, oh, they're coming to the program, the SPD is outside watching for us and stuff like that. They're gonna follow us. That was one reason why it was so important to have um, interim Shreveport Police Chief Ben Raymond there. So, um, who was who was wonderful throughout the whole entire process. He was just like, "Look, we have bigger fish to fry as far as you know, hitting some it, as far as one of your participants and charging them with a paraphernalia charge." Now, and what we tell our participants when when they come in for the first time is that, "Hey, this protects you from a paraphernalia charge." only in the city of Shreveport. So if you've got a baggie on you, that's a completely different story. So, you know, that's on you, but we can help you with the paraphernalia charge because the, the Shreveport Police Department doesn't care if you still got a little residual in your, your syringes, especially that was the concern with them bringing back their sharps containers that had, you know, um, that, were our, that were used. So, all right. All right. So now we're going to talk about data and demographics. And I love data. <laughs> you can ask anybody that I work with. <laughs> um, so, as of January 31st of 2020, We've enrolled 116 participants. We've distributed 64, over 64,000 sterile syringes, and we've disposed of 8,649. I do have to say, when we very first started, you know, we were only going to, um, it, this was right when COVID was happening. And so we had to adjust the way that we did business as far as the syringe service program, you know, is involved. So, um, you know, instead of giving somebody, giving a participant 50 syringes, we would give them 200 syringes just to minimize the amount that they would have to get out um, and come to our program on Friday. So as of January 31st of 2020, we have distributed over 209 doses of naloxone. And um, it has been self-reported that it has been it has been used over it has been used 35 times. And I do want to thank CADA because we are very we have a wonderful relationship with them. And they supply all the naloxone to us. So they have a grant um, through the Office of Behavioral Health. That, that, that provide, that purchases naloxone for them. And so we are, they bring that down to us and that's how we distribute it, so. And I do wanna say that as far as, um, you know, I was discussing how naloxone only works for heroin and opioids. Um, a majority of our participants are methamphetamine users. There's 102 of them. We only have, we have not only, but we have 14 people that um, actually inject heroin. And four of those people, that is their drug of choice. That is the only drug that they do. And the other 10 do both heroin and methamphetamine. So um, we've got 30 participants that inject Suboxone and Subutex. So we which is, um, you know, that is for treatment of opioid addiction. It's Suboxone and Subutex. All right. So the folks that we have that come to our program, you can see the breakdown as far as, as, far as gender goes. We have a lot of males. 
65% males, 34% um, females, and 1% other. And um, the other is, um, you know, folks that identify as transgender. So you'll see the breakdown as far as sexual orientation with 64% being straight. And then the race, 83% of our participants are white. And the 5%, the other that's right there, they are uh, biracial. And then HIV status, see that 80% are negative, 13% don't know, and there's 7% that are positive. And then here's the hepatitis C. And a lot of the folks that are positive for hepatitis C have not received treatment for, for hep C. Um, there's been before the former Secretary of Health, Rebecca, Dr. Gee, one of her big pushes, one of her initiatives was getting um, the treatment for hepatitis C in a subscription model. So, and I believe that runs out at the end of, um, of, of this year. So for hepatitis C, a lot of providers would not provide treatment to people who use drugs and a requirement of them was for them to be sober, which, you know, puts a huge barrier, you know, to care for our participants. So, but with this specific program, you know, there is not any, there's, there's no barriers to care. So we're working with the Infectious Disease Clinic um, and the, um, the SHIP department program office, you know, to get our participants into treatment as soon as possible. And then you'll see that we have injection frequency per day. And then secondary exchange. When we're talking about secondary exchange, we're talking about um, how many people they're getting syringes for. Because a huge thing with syringe service programs is trust. So we are in the process of, we will, we will continue to have to build the trust of this specific community. Because they think that, you know, if they come to this program, you know, the, like I said earlier, the cops are going to come and, you know, they're waiting outside to arrest them and everything. And, you know, that's not the case. And so when we have folks that are coming and supplying for 10 plus people, we give them some additional syringes. So because 200 syringes can go pretty quick, especially if you're passing them out to people. And then also if you're injecting two to three times, you know, a day. Because we want, we stress to our participants to only use that specific syringe one time and then dispose of it. So, because if you, if, if a participant utilizes a syringe multiple times, it causes more harm than anything to their veins. So, all right. So the items that we offer um, at the syringe service program are sterile syringes. We have these little kits that I'll show you in just a little bit. Um, hand sanitizer, fentanyl test strips, naloxone, wound care kits, and safe sex tools. So, um, you know, with COVID, we've been stressing, you know, to our participants to make sure that your hands are as clean as possible because we do not want any infections um, as far as when they're getting ready to um, inject to their specific site. So, so we, these are the um, these are the different syringes that we offer. We offer from a um, a twenty five gauge, which is a one inch, which is super super long. So, uh, a, a lot of our folks are like, no, thank you. <laughs> We'll go with something a little bit smaller. 
So, and these are all the different syringes that we offer, but, you know, a lot of um, folks that inject methamphetamines, they tend to gear towards the 31s and the 30 shorts, so. All right, so in these little kits that we have, if you can see my little thing, you'll see these little bags that we come up with. And they've got um, sterile water, cookers and twist eyes, ointments, little cotton filters, bandages, alcohol pads, and then tourniquets. Um, we provide the sterile water to um, our participants because if they are if they're preparing their drugs for injection, we want them to use the the most sanit the, the sterilest anything everything that we provide them is as sterile as possible and when we put these kits together we're wearing a mask we've got you know gloves on anything that we touch is you know we make sure it's sterilized so you know when a participant is you know getting their drugs ready we tell them use the sterile water to cook your drugs down in your little cookers with the twist ties so People are like, well, why do you give them twist ties? Well, we don't want them to burn their fingers on the little cookers and everything like that instead of using a spoon. So this is something that they can dispose of pretty quickly. I mean, you know, they can dispose of and it's not a spoon that they're lugging around in their bag or anything. So um, we provide the ointments because we wanna make sure that our folks or after they inject, that they put the ointment on and, you know, take care of their injection site as much as possible. You know, do the ointment, put the bandage on, but before you inject, make sure that you utilize the alcohol pads. Because a lot of our participants are, they're travelers. So it's not that they're homeless, but they're going from one home to the other, or, you know, they're injecting wherever they can, they can inject at. So, um, the little cottons and the, the little cottons that you see the picture of that is whenever so after they cook their drugs down they're supposed to put a couple of those little filters in and then they put their syringe into the cooker where the filters the little cotton filter is and that's how they they'll retract the syringe through that so the cotton is there so it helps filter out any particulates so um, as much as possible, because you don't know where the drug or what it's been cut with or anything like that. So we provide the safest way possible for someone to inject drugs. So we are open every Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and that is um, at our main office on Centenary Boulevard. We also have um, a hotline that is answered if, you know, somebody has any questions or anything like that, they can just text or they can call that specific hotline. And that's it. Any questions or comments? Well, I want to thank you, Harshi, for this great presentation. So far, I haven't seen any questions come to the chat box, but a lot of kudos and good jobs and great service and those kinds of things. Um, we do have one question. It says, are there any advocacy efforts to develop or legalize safe injection spaces? So, um, not at the moment right now, because we are just trying to launch the um, a syringe service program in ed, in every single city or parish or anything like that. So, um, because this is not, this law that was signed in 2017 does not cover the whole entire state. So right now, that's what we're working at is getting um, a blanket ordinance that allows anybody in the state of Louisiana to operate a syringe service program. So that's a little bit down the line um, as far as getting a safe injection, you know, um, facility. So I don't know if everybody knows about um, these, these little facilities that you can go to and everything and um, 
they will have either a nurse or nurse practitioner that is there that you can lay down and they will help inject the drugs into you. As, I mean, and that would monitor you while you're going through your high, um, you know, to ensure that nothing happens. You don't overdose or anything like that. So um, there, that is not in the works yet. We're just trying to get a syringe service program in every single city or every parish right now. So, but that's a great question. Um, one question we got is how can we help? It's so Just hard to general. say, right? <laughs> especially COVID. This is the way that you can help us is to have these discussions with your family and your friends about syringe service programs, because I bet you every single one of us has been affected by somebody that is using drugs. Um, and just having that open dialogue is what we need to do. That it's not, we need to destigmatize um, drug use because it's a real issue and people are not gonna be comfortable talking about it. We don't start the conversation. So I encourage everybody to have those conversations with people that they know. Cause I'll tell you what, when we very first started doing this, and um, my daughter is on here, and she'll probably laugh at it too. So, um, you know, sitting at the dining room table at Sunday dinner with my mother-in-law and father, my my father-in-law, mm -hmm. talking about getting this ordinance passed and everything like that. And even with my husband, you know, you, they just don't understand that, you know they remember the Nancy Reagan, you know, slogan of just don't, I mean, don't do drugs. So or just say no to drugs. Or they see that commercial where your brain is being fried and everything. So that's not what harm reduction is about. It's about, you know, meeting people because things like this, drug use is gonna happen. People are gonna have sex. I mean, you know, things that, these are uncomfortable conversations that, you know, we need to discuss and we need to bring back, you know, we need to bring it to the table so you can help to change people's minds about syringe service programs. And I do have to say, our city councilman, Jeff Everson, was very, very thoughtful going into getting this passed because he wanted it to be passed unanimously. And we had a lot of pushback at the beginning of this of what are you guys doing over there and everything like that. And people from like, you know, therapists and everything. Like, I mean, you know, we're just like, what do you, this is what, this is gonna save the community money. And this is what we have people that are injecting drugs in our community and we need to help them. So, but yes, have those conversations, please. We have another question. It says, have there been overdose, overdose deaths here locally during COVID? Yes. So unfortunately, we have had six of our participants that have passed away um, in the last three months. Uh, and it's because <laughs> you get to know um you get to know the participants and you know their quirks and everything like that and and it, it's and i'll tell you this is that all of our participants are extremely grateful for what we do i have never been thanked so much uh because they feel like they have been forgotten or you know this is something that treeport would never do you know in its right minds and everything so it's just it's, yeah, our, it, it, it's been very difficult to lose, you know, the six that we have, but, um, you know, we've created the relationships with other participants to be able to tell us these things that, hey, such and such, you know, died the other day, or they're in jail, or anything like that, or, hey, there's some really bad drugs, you know, that's on the street, and it's named this, can you pass the word along? And so that's something that, you know, we're working on and building those relationships and building the trust 
because we rely on the participants to spread the word of what we of what we do in our community. Also, that you have access to a syringe service program, and there's no judgments as far as you know. Hey, I need so many, or I need this, or you know, I'm having a party. We had one phone call, and they were we didn't realize that people were having chem sex parties, you know, in the city of Shreveport. <laughs> And they needed syringes for 15 people. So, <laughs> so that has been, an, uh, that was very eye awakening, um, you know, a uh, phone call. And I think Miss Virginia is on uh, today who, who took that phone call. And so we've kind of built a relationship with this little group of people, um, you know, about their chem sex parties. So we were thinking that, oh, that happened, that's happening in New Orleans and Dallas. No, it's happening in Shreveport. So. Wow. We have another question. It says, what are future plans to continue expanding the program within Shreveport and outside of Shreveport? Right now, that is kind of, we've not hit a full year of um, next Jan January of 2021 will be our um, a full year of having, you know, a syringe service program in, in the city of Shreveport. Um, we would like to have an ordinance passed in the city of Bosher and other rural areas. Um, I've heard many, many discussions, I mean, or many conversations about, you know, we need to do this in um, Minden or we need to do this in Natchitoches because this is a problem, not just in the city of Shreveport, but it's, it's all across the nation. And you know, and that's something that we we need to work on in building those relationships with relationships with city council people. Um, it was easy for us because we had Jeff Everson and everything. So, um, which is not, has, it, it's, we need to go out, we need to build those relationships, but we've got to get over COVID first, so. Uh, we have another, uh, how can we all help with this question, so. Is there anything that you would like for, you know, everyone that's on today, what can they do in addition to starting those uh, uncomfortable conversations? Well, right now, um, that is, uh, that those conversations are important. And then also changing your mind about people who use drugs or people that are living with HIV. Um, because living with HIV is no longer a death sentence because medical technology has really come a long way. So just treating people as they are and where they're at and using language, people first language, for example, um, you know, not calling, you know, people who use drugs or inject drugs junkies or crackheads or you know, addicts or anything like that, you know, that's why we refer to, um, we refer to participants as people who use drugs or people who inject drugs or people who are living with HIV or AIDS. So you put the people first. So that in your daily life would be something that everybody needs to do a better job of, of not calling our participants crackheads or not having judgment on them because you don't know, you know, what has gone on with this person. And I will finish this with a, I mean, I'll finish this answer. It's not an answer to this question, but um, we did have, a, we do have a participant, actually I haven't seen him in a couple months, which is great because he was talking about going to treatment because he was, in order for him to see his child, he needed to, he needed to, you know, um, sober up and everything. So, and unfortunately, in his case, he got into a really awful car wreck and was prescribed opiates and everything. And, you know, the opioid that he was prescribed were not helping his pain. And so he turned to injecting drugs because that's what made the pain go away. And that's how he lived his life. So, um, so I hope he's doing well and very positive vibes. So, you know, people who, who use drugs or inject drugs, there's a story behind them. So there's a reasoning of how they got there. 
not passing judgment on them is super important right now. So. Awesome. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, there are none in the group chat. If there are questions, please feel free to ask them. But I do want to thank you again for doing this great presentation today and being the first of our Tough Topic series for this year. Um, it was a great presentation, very interesting. And I agree, this is something that we probably need more of in other places. Um, so thank you again. I do want to uh, thank the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Public Health Region 7 for reaching out to us to work together to present this tough topic series this year. And I do want to encourage everyone, if you haven't done so already, to sign up for our next tough topic discussion next Thursday when we'll have Andrew Amin from CADA to talk about anti-overdose reversal and Narcan training. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and sign up. and. Um, so thank you for everyone for being on here tonight. And thank you again, Hershey, for this great presentation. Thank you for having me. Oh, it was our pleasure. All right, well, if there are no more questions, then that will do it for us tonight. And we will see you guys uh, next week. Yes, this recording will be available to share with others who couldn't make it tonight. We will upload this to the Street Memorial Library's YouTube channel. And we'll send out that link to everyone that registered for uh, tonight's topic. So you can share that with all your friends and um, for anyone who had missed the, the conversation tonight. All right. All right. Well, thank you to everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thank you.